Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Be here today. So today I'm going to talk about understanding and surviving uh, internet path failures. So first, let me give an overview of my work. So during the last few years, I have been working on a system for diagnosing internet failures and uh, for protocols which are robust to internet failures. So today, I will focus on Planisphere, which is a large-scale distributed system for uh, diagnosing internet failures. So Planisphere offers new techniques for uh, quantitatively and qualitatively better failure detection and also provides some insights about the failures on the internet. So after that, I will also briefly talk about uh, multipass TCP, which is a new transport layer protocol which can take advantage of the redundant passes on the internet to improve the throughput and the robustness. Uh, I have also worked on reordering robust TCP, which is an uh, enhanced version of TCP, which are reordered to uh, uh, re robust to reorder packets and probabilistic packet scheduling for uh, achieving proportional fairness among competing TCP flows. So first, let me give an overview of uh, the overall picture of the Internet. So today, the Internet consists of uh, many network service providers or autonomous systems. So when a client tries to reach a web server as shown as a blue path in this figure, it has to traverse a number of routers or autonomous systems. So some of the routers and links are within an autonomous system, while some are between two autonomous systems. So the end-to-end -end performance between the client and web server depends on many independent autonomous systems. Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's the case. So here, I, I don't go to the details, try to distinguish between ISP or ASs, but uh, occasionally it do occurs like due to merging or split uh, ISP, like APNT might own multiple ASs, or that, I think that's a common case. However, here I just try to use autonomous system as... Uh, single AS belongs to multiple. Uh, I'm not aware of this. So actually, the, these ASs, they are under separate administrative control. And they are actually a group of routers or links managed by a single institution. So we can classify these ASs into several tiers based on their size. So the tier 1 ASs, the, 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 at the top of the hierarchy, there are a small number of largest ISPs uh, with national backbones, such as AT&T or Sprint. And in the middle of the hierarchy, there is a fair amount of mid-size or regional ISPs. And at the bottom, there are a very large number of small networks, such as a company or a university. So there is no single AS on the internet has a complete picture of the internet. So this is mainly for scalability reason. The internet is, consists of many networks. So we can't, uh, if our AS has to keep complete information about all the other networks, this is not going to be scalable. Also, these ASs, they are often competing with each other. So in, they are unwilling to share sensitive information, such as their topology, their routing policy, or their traffic. So because of this, uh, the failure diagnosis on the internet is extremely difficult. So let me show this by using an example. Suppose a client is trying to talk to a web server using the blue pass here. So at some moment, there is a link outage between AS3 and AS4. So that failure information will be propagated within the routers in AS4 and further got propagated to AS5. So AS5 
might decide to choose an alternate path through AS7 to reach the web server. But during this period, the client might observe the, the, the web server is unreachable or the network speed is extremely slow. So the client have no idea about what's going on because she treats the network as a black box with mysterious uh, internals. So she might report to her ISP, try to investigate this problem for her. However, in this case, his provider, AS6, only knows the information about the network under its control. It has no idea about what's going on between AS3 and AS4. So uh, AS6, the service provider, cannot answer this question. So all he can tell the client is, uh, I don't see any problem in my network, and I don't know what's the problem here. So the client may or may not be satisfied with this answer. Also, the failure duration is highly varied on the internet. Some failure might stay for a very short period. So if we don't have enough information, record enough information, when the failure occurs, it will become more complicated for us to, to try to troubleshoot this failure when the failure has disappeared. So, uh, um, so although failure diagnosis is extremely difficult, the, uh, the, for, it's very important for us to be able to diagnose failure on the internet. So this is because failure occurs very frequently on the internet. There are many reasons can lead to failures, like misconfigurations, poor outage, or fiber cut. Although the internet is designed to be self-healing, but in many cases, a failure may take a long time to recover. So if we can know where the failure occur, it will, we will be able to in, uh, improve the accountability of the internet. For example, as a customer or uh, ISP, I can have some idea about how to select better service provider or how to select better peers. Or if I can have a service level agreement with certain ISP, I can obtain compensation for violating this service level agreement. Also, if we can, we can know why this failure occurred, it will help the network operator to fix the problem more quickly and also prevent a similar problem from occurring in the future. So there has been many work on failure diagnosis on the internet. Generally, there are two approaches. The first one is called the ISP-centric approach. In this approach, the ISPs use various internal data, like routing message or traffic statistics try to troubleshoot failure in their network. So the advantage of this approach is the ISPs have pretty complete information about their network, so they can isolate the failure more accurately. However, the disadvantage is the, the data required in this approach are often preparatory. So this approach becomes less useful for diagnosing failure outside this ISP. The second approach is called the end system based approach. In this approach, people often use probing tools like ping or traceout to locate failures on the internet. So traceout is a tool to uh, discover the forwarding path from a source to a destination on the internet. So let me briefly uh, explain how traceout works. So each packet on the internet carry a time to leave value uh, that value will be initialized by the sender and get decrement by one along each hop. So when the TTL value reaches zero, the router will discard that packet. This prevents a packet to get captured in a routing loop for a very long time. So suppose in this example, the source tried to discover the first router on that path. It will send a packet with TTL value equals one. So when that packet arrive at the first router, the TTL value will become zero, and the first router will send a notification back to the source. So the source learns the IP of the first router in that path. And then the source will send an another packet with TTL value equals two to discover the second router. And this process continues until the source discover all the routers along that path. So the, the advantage of the end system based approach is it's very flexible because any user can use this tool to diagnose failures on the internet. Also, because the end user are often directly affected by the failures, so they can initiate the diagnose pr procedure more quickly. However, because each end host only have a very limited view on the network, so it becomes less accurate in isolating the failures. 
and major problem with the existing end system based approach is its scalability issue. So to, uh, typically in the current end system based approach, they have a bunch of nodes at different parts of the network, and all the nodes try to periodically uh, probe each other to monitor the health of the paths between uh, two nodes in the system. So they, suppose there are n nodes in this system, the probing cost will be n square. And when the number of nodes becomes very large, this system is not going to be very scalable. Also because their, uh, their probing approach requires cooperation from both ends of the path, so they can only use for monitor the path, bit, uh, a limited number of paths between the participating nodes. So we have developed a planning theory, which is a large-scale distributed diagnosis system for failures on the internet. So planning theory is an inter-system-based approach. Uh, so it, can, it doesn't require any private data, so it can be used for diagnose failures, both inside certain ISP and outside ISP. Also, we notice because each end host only have a very incomplete information about the network. So in planning theory, we try to combine the partial view from a large number of nodes and get a more accurate information about the failures. Also, uh, in planning here, we try to combine passive monitoring with active probing. So during most period, we don't do any probing and we only initiate our active probing during anonymous period. So we can easily scale to a large number of nodes because we have limited overhead. So in planning here, we focus on routing anomalies, which has uh, incurring topological changes in the network. So because these type of uh, problems have significant impact on end-to-end -end performance, it can cause uh, network disconnectivity or high loss rate or high latency. However, we try not to focus on congestion in our system because congestion usually doesn't incur uh, topological change in the network and uh, there are different approaches to diagnose congestion on the internet. Uh, typically, people probe a network path hop by hop, which is quite different from the techniques in our system. So the key problem we try to uh, solve in planning theory is how we can achieve scalability. So we observe that there are wide area services like peer-to-peer -peer system or content distribution network they have a very large client population at, uh, dis, uh, at very different geographic locations, and they generate large traffic volume across highly diverse paths. So the traffic generated by these uh, wireless services will reveal the information about the status of the network. So in planning here, we passively monitor suspicious events in this traffic, which are possibly caused by routing problem then we try to launch active probing on demand from multiple locations to confirm and isolate these problems. So let me uh, explain how Pandas here works using a simple example. Suppose two computers are talking to each other on the internet and generate some traffic between them. And at some moment, there is some routing problem occur between these two computers and uh, generate some suspicious events in the traffic, then one of the nodes who detect this suspicious event will send a request to many nodes at different parts of the internet and coordinate all of them to probe the problematic node. So by combining the partial views from many vantage points on the internet, we can have a more complete information about the failure. For example, which part of the network are actually affected by the routing problem. Then all these nodes will send the, the probing result back to the requesting node for further analysis. So here's the outline of the Planisphere work. First, I'm going through the online components in Planisphere, which uh, include how we detect suspicious events in the traffic and how we probe these events when they are detected. Then I will describe the offline analysis part in Planisphere, which include how we confirm a routing problem, how we can classify this problem, and how we can estimate their scope. Finally, I go through some failure analysis results based on a three-month monitoring period on internet 
uh, we will look at loop-based anomaly, non-loop-based anomaly, and quantify how effectively current technique can help bypass the anomalies. So first, let's look at how we detect suspicious events in the traffic. So the difficulty here is we don't want to continuously probe a network path because we don't want to generate too much probing traffic. Also, we don't, probably don't have cooperation from both ends of the path because we want to monitor paths not just between the participating nodes. So we observe that a routing problem sometimes can cause some suspicious events in the traffic. So in planets here, we focus on two suspicious events. The first one is the TTL chain. As we have described before, each packet on the network will carry a TTL value. And uh, suppose in this example, a, TT, a packet of the TTL is initialized to 32, and it will go through a path with four hops to reach the destination. So the TTL will become 28 when the packet arrives at the destination. At some moment, if the path change to another one with only three hops, the TTL value will become 29 when the packet arrives at the destination. So this TTL change indicates some routing problem has occurred. The second type is called inconsecutive timeouts. So TCP use timeouts to recover from packet losses. So inconsecutive timeouts in the TCP flow means there are some idling period yeah, so we try to identify topological changes in the network. So, so I will show in the later slides, uh, the end user will actually observe significant pa uh, performance degradation during these past changes. It, do, uh, it does affect end user experience. Yeah. Uh, not always, but in many cases, it has significant impact. Right, 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 right. How, uh, although the root change indicates the routing protocol is trying to uh, uh, react to a routing failure, but however, we try to look at why we are focusing on not just the root change, but actually which link actually causes this root change, which link audit or router failure causes this root change. So, does that answer your question? So, I mean, if the network is stable, there should not be any topological change. Any topological change usually indicates there is some problem in the network which causes this well, path well, changes. Well, what if the operator changed their weight on, on one of the links? The, the links are still part of them. So I think in that case. So in which case, there's, there's not going to be any technical loss on either of the paths. Uh, it's going to transition to a new path and traffic may not. Yeah, so. Right, I think we try to focus on those uh, changes are actually caused by failures on the internet. Not, we are not trying to focus on those caused by the uh, policy or yeah, traffic. I think, I think the question is that from this TTL change, how do you distinguish the uh, We cannot distinguish by using the TTL change. However, in later slides, I describe how we can confirm this problem by using the multiple by using active probing. Also, I think the, uh, for even for traffic engineering purpose, these will still cause unpredictable behavior in the network, but it's still possible to cause end-to-end -end performance degradation. So although I, I think uh, if we look at the later slides, we will show no matter which the root cause of this routing chain, it will significantly impact on the end users. So we will see severe packet losses and delays during these flow changes. It's now done the study and you know the arbitration of failures. Uh, could you continuously probe the portion of high granularities if the analyst cost would have been acceptable? Um, so I don't think, because most period the internet is OK. But if you just continuously probe, you probably still miss many of the failures. If you probe at a very cost grain, like one minute, you probably miss many of the failures. But if you probe very frequently, that will incur many probing overhead. Okay. 
So the second type is called the timeout. TCP use timeout to recover from packet losses. So when there is n consecutive timeouts in the TCP flow, that indicates there is some idling period where no packet has been successfully being transmitted. So however, packet losses can cause both by congestion and the routing problems. We try to, we have to uh, pick n carefully, try to dis distinguish between these two cases. So previous study found that the most congestion period on the internet are pretty short. 95% of them are less than 200 milliseconds. So therefore we choose n equals four in our system. So that will translate to three to 16 seconds of idling period. So these long idling period are likely caused by routing problem instead of congestion. So in planet theory, we use active probing to confirm and analyze failure. So planet theory can use to monitor and diagnose routing problem uh, in any wider services. However, in the following slide, I will use a content distribution network as our hosting service. So planet theory does three types of probe. The first one is the baseline probe. This is done when a new IP appears to our system. So when the client is trying to connect to a CDN node B here, we will do a traceout from the CDN node B to the client. This traceout serves to discover the network path from the CDN node to the client during normal period. So the second type is forward probe. This is done when some suspicious event is detected. Suppose there is a link audit between router R1 and R2 in this example. And the node B will detect this suspicious event and it will send a request to node A and C to coordinate all of them to probe the client. So these forward probes serve to discover the network path during the problematic period. Then we can compare the network path during normal period with the network path during the problematic period to estimate the scope of the failure. For example, in here, because the link failure occurred between R1 and R2, so the probing from A and B will stop at R2, while the probing from C will successfully reach the client. So we can guess there is some problem between R1 and R2 in this example. We will also do four reprobes after the, the suspicious event was detected. So this reprobe will help us to estimate the duration of the failure. So when the link between R1 and R2 is recovered, the reprobe will reach the client and we know how long the, uh, the, the link audit stay. Is the Sorry? The right, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So actually, uh, I will. So actually, we try to first we try to infer if the failure is actually due to the forwarding problem or reverse problem. Then, if we make sure the 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 failure is due to the forward problem, then we will try to estimate the try to analyze this failure because in this example we don't have probing at the client in the CDN example. So I will give you more details in the later slides. So, so how does it happen here? It looks like there was a feedback in the case. So this is actually uh, an exponential backoff. So the first reprobe is at half an hour. Then why, not, why not five minutes? So five I think this is many. Uh, so based on a previous study, we find that most of the internet failure got resolved within uh, half an hour. So we do the first probe at half an hour. The, few, the later probe will help us to estimate the duration for those extremely long failures. And uh, do you have to uh, do probes beforehand to know that what the original path was? Yeah. And so, so how often do you do that? Uh, so we do this when a new client actually connect to our system. Then okay. probably if a client talk to the CDN node for a very long time, we will try to redo the trace out. Right. So I, think, I think half an hour. Yeah. 
So uh, our system had running um, uh, over 300 nodes across 145 sites uh, on the internet at different locations. Uh, however, we can't afford to probe each suspicious event from all of these nodes because that will generate too much probing traffic. What is, what is uh, I, a site means there is a bunch like uh, MIT or, or Princeton, there is a bunch of nodes within each organization. So I will talk about groups in the folder. So we, our goal is try to reduce the probing overhead without losing too much accuracy. So therefore, we try to uh, group all these nodes based on their geographic locations. So we have 30 groups based on how close these nodes are, based on geographic distance. So for each suspicious event, we will randomly select one node within each group to do the probing. So this is based on the intuition that the nodes who is close to each other are likely to share a similar view on the network. So it probably don't generate too much useful information to, to do probe from two groups. So we don't do such fine-grained uh, calculation. I think the goal of our, we know that, I think it's reasonable to assume that the nodes who are close to each other are, probably have similar views. However, we know that it also depends on their aspirin service providers. So in our study, we, we are not focusing on how accurately, so how we can optimize our probing, our accuracy of our system. We just want to uh, focus on what we can do with the existing system by probing from multiple vantage points. We, we haven't focused on how accurate we can diagnose. So I think uh, also another thing we, we notice, if we want to have uh, use such fine-grained information, we have to discover this information, which probably will incur some cost. I think that's uh, right. Right. So I think this is a reasonable, very reasonable assumption. Uh, however, we currently are not doing this right now, and this is one of our future work. So we want to investigate how much benefit we can achieve by doing such fine-grained classification on all the nodes. I don't agree that the nodes that are at the same level of locations have roughly the same view of the internet. I mean, otherwise, nobody would use multi points. Right, right, right. I, I agree with you. But however, the nodes who are, who are far away from each other are, are more likely to have uh, different views. So this is just a rough grouping. So also, we try to select 30 groups to probe each uh, anonymous events. So just to make sure we have enough diversity in our probing node. So we have running our system for more than three uh, months uh, during 2004. And during that period, we observed uh, close to 900,000 unique IPs. And we traversed over 10,000 ASs on the internet. This is over half of the total number of ASs on the internet. So as we have uh, described in previous slides, we classify all the ASs into five tiers based on their size. So these graphs show the coverage for the ASs in each tier. As we can see, the tier one, tier two, tier three are represent the core ASs of the internet, and we have pretty good coverage. For the tier one ASs, we traverse 100% of them. Uh, but even for the edge ASs in the internet, like the tier five ASs, we still covers over 40% of them. So during the three month period, our system reported over 2 million suspicious events. And we use four conditions to confirm these events are actually caused by routing problems before we do any analysis on them. The first is, if we observe that a sequence router is traversed repeatedly during the trace out, then this probably caused by routing loops. The second is, 
if we find the trace route during the problematic period is different from the trace route during the normal period, then that indicates a routing chain. So sometimes we often find that although the trace route from the local CDN node cannot reach the client, there exists another probing node, remote probing node, which can successfully reach the client. So this indicates some partial unreachability. So finally, the trace route from the local CDN node might return a destination unreachable message. This indicates some intermediate router doesn't know how to forward the packet to the client. So this graph shows the breakdown of other events. So currently, we just use trace out to determine reachability. So. So we actually compare the trace out during the normal period with the trace out during the problematic period. So if the if the so we can actually ignore those routers who doesn't respond and compare the paths with during the normal period with the problematic period. If there is some routing change, they are definitely due to some routing problems. But we are pretty conservative about confirming this. So using this method, we probably ignore some of the routing problem. Actually, it's routing, but, but cannot confirm use trace off. Yeah, so I'm going to go through some of the reasons that why we cannot confirm some suspicious events. So actually, we are very conservative about confirming this uh, routing problem because we don't want to generate misleading results by including some events which are actually not caused by routing problems. And uh, there are several reasons possibly cause these unconfirmed events. So the first one is ultra short failures. So a failure might stay for a very short period. Bef before our system can respond, it has already disappeared. So these failures, they are likely due to the routing protocol is trying to adapt to a failure. So we consider these failures are not very interesting because these failures are unavoidable. The routing problem has to need some time to, to recover from the failure. The second type is called aggressive timeouts. Although we try to wait four consecutive timeouts to, to, to launch our probing, however, we find different operating systems have different default timeout value. Some operating systems use a very conservative timeout, like Linux use only 200 milliseconds. So these will cause us to, to generate uh, aggressive timeout, uh, which will cause us to, to report some, some events actually caused by congestion. Uh, actually, uh, we do the infer the timeout both at the the node and at the sender. The sender might run in different operating systems. So we uh, we try to uh, actually we detect two types of timeout. The first is the timeout at the planning lab node. So we call the timeout on the forward path. Also, we try to detect timeouts at the client. So a client might keep resending packets, which arrive at the. Yeah. So the code here nodes runs on 150 planet nodes, and we use all the planet nodes as our probing nodes. So actually, I think you can simply, this is due to a policy reason, because the OSC node has to pay for the traffic. So that's why a coding only run North American node. And uh, actually, we can, if without this restriction, we can run the CDN node and our monitoring and our probing node at uh, all the participating nodes. As for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the, other the other end might be a client running like Windows. So, so we, we, we notice the timeout at the client by observing us, the same packets got retransmitted several times at the, at the CDN node. So at CDN node might observe 
a client keep retransmitting the same packet several times. This indicates the client actually run into timeout. Yeah, but the act got lost on the on the CDN node to the client. So that's one of the way we can infer the routing problem on the forward pass, not on the reverse pass. So the finally, uh, there are two other reasons, like asymmetric passes. So the internet pass is asymmetric means the forward pass from the sender to the receiver might be different from the reverse pass from the receiver back to the sender. So in planet here, we can only um, diagnose problem on the forward pass from the CDN node to the client. However, we use TTL chain to indicate routing problem. TTL chain only indicates the routing problem from the client to the CDN node. So sometimes, although there is problem on the reverse pass, but there is no problem on the forward pass. So this will cause some uh, false alarms in our system. The final group is pass-based TTL. Again, the TTL, we use TTL value to infer routing problem. However, sometimes there are multiple clients share the same IP, like behind a netbox or firewall, and different clients using different operating system. And the TTL of different packets by sending by different client might have different value arrived at the CD node. That will cause a consistent TTL change on the pass. So. Okay, probably. Yeah. Okay. And in, in this case, the, the only information you have, or, or, or the main way to detect problems is basically because you don't have TTL. So uh, for TTL, the, I think the web traffic is still two way. So actually, we do uh, notice many TTL change from the client to the CDN node. Right, right, right. But on the, from CDN to client, you don't have any Right, right. Yeah, that's one of the problems with our system because we don't have a control at the client. However, if we run our system at, in a peer-to-peer -peer system where we have both control at the sender and receiver, we will have more information about the failures. So uh, for all those confirmed anomaly, we try to classify them into uh, loop-based or non-loop-based anomaly based on their pattern. So if a sequence of a router is uh, tra traversed uh, several times, then we call this a uh, routing loop. Otherwise, we classify them as non-loop anomaly. So for loop anomalies, we classify them into temporary and persistent loops, depending on whether the loop stay until the trace terminates. So also for the non-loop anomalies, we classify them into path changes and path audit. So suppose a CDN node use this path to reach the client during normal period, and uh, during the problematic period, it changes to another path. Then we call this a uh, path change. So in another case, the local node use this path to reach the client, and during the problematic period, the trace stop at some intermediate router then we call this uh, pass audit. So this graph shows the breakdown of all the uh, confirmed anomalies. We confirm over 200,000 anomalies in three months. This uh, approximately corresponds to two confirmed uh, routing problems per minute, and it's high, uh, 100 times higher than previous approach based on end-to-end -end measurement. Also, this, as we can see from this graph, Pass changes uh, consist of 44% of the uh, routing problems, and pass audit uh, consists of 32% of them. Depending on whether we can confirm the pass audit is on the forward pass from the CDN node to the client or not, we classify them into the forward audit and other audit. So temporary and persistent loop consists of 1% and 7% of the anomalies, and the final category is uh, temporary anomalies. There's 16% of them. How do you count them? Sorry? How do you count these? Uh, so, so actually, we count the events based on the client IP and the time. So if the IP is different, we will consider this as a unique event. 
also if the the client uh, constantly run into problem during some period, we will only count one event during a uh, two hour window. Yeah. 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 So I think the I think it's reasonable to 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 consider this scenario that a failure might uh, affect many IPs at the same time. However, uh, it will be nice if we can correlate the observations from different uh, vantage points to identify the root cause, which failure actually caused many of the observed suspicious events. Uh, however, uh, currently uh, we don't have a very good technique to identify the root cause of, uh, of a routing problem. So that's why we don't do this here. Well, could you just do the simplest thing of grouping uh, them by prefix? Uh, grouping, that's a reasonable thing. But uh, however, we don't know which, uh, if two IP within the same prefix fail, are they really due to our uh, failure affecting these prefix, or this just due to two separate failures at the time? I think. Um, we try not to, in our study, we didn't deal with this effect. I think it will be nice if we can further investigate by identifying the root cause, then we can correlate these failures together. So that's a different take of straw on what the simplest possible thing is. And now it's just going to by prefix, driven by time. Are these things spread out in form of time? Uh, so uh, we don't have this kind of data. However, we found different uh, IPs show different behavior. Some of the crimes actually uh, occur running to failure more frequently, while other crimes are pretty stable, only running to problem very occasionally. So I don't see there is uh, a uniform distribution across all the crimes. I think different depending on totally depending on which network has this kind of traverse. All 207,000 occurred at 11:59 a.m. on one day. Then, you know, they were kind of more likely to be one of them rather than 207,000. Yeah, yeah. So I think it would be interesting if we can correlate the separate failures together. But however, without a very good way to to identify the root cause, I think it's hard to correlate them. Even they occur closer in time. However, but they might detect a different CDN node. I, I was just curious. Yeah, yeah, I think. Like th right, right. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it would be interesting to do such kind of correlations. Uh, actually, I mean, what were the special characteristics of the 12% event that people confirmed as being problem? So I will show in our later slides, many of the failure we detect actually occur at the last hop. So these events are unlikely to affect many IPs at the same time. So however, I think if a failure occurs in the core of the network, they are more likely to affect multiple kinds at the same time. But many of the audits, at least for audits, many of them occur at the last hop. So, so I think uh, in the later slide, I will try to show the distance, the how far away the failure to the edge of the network. That probably can give you some sense of how many failures that can affect multiple clients at the same time. So now let's look at how we can estimate the scope of the failure. So we use the scope of failure to try to identify how accurately we can pinpoint the location of the failure. So we, so we use the, we define the scope of failure to be the routers that possibly change their next hop to the destination. So for example, if a local result, local node uses this path to reach the client, 
and during the problematic period, it switched to another path. So we know that router A, B, C possibly has changed their next half value. So these routers possibly have introduced the failure. And the scope of the failure is three. But in some cases, we can take advantage of multiple vantage points to narrow the scope of failure. Suppose we have another node, a remote probing node, which do a trace out to the kind. That trace out merge into the original path at router 3 and follow the same path to the client. So we know router C actually has not changed its left hop value. Only router A and B has possibly affected by the routing problem. So we can narrow the scope of the failure from 3 hop down to 2 hop by using multiple vendor points. So one of the goal of our study is we want to uh, know how effective the existing technique can help bypass failures on the internet. So there are two popular techniques for bypassing failures. The first one is multi-homing. So suppose a client to talk to the web server using the blue pass here, and uh, when there is a link outage between AS3 and AS4, so if AS5 have two providers, AS4 and AS7, it can select another path from AS7 to reach the web server. So this is multi-homing. Or alternatively, the client can directly send a packet to an intermediate node, ask that node to relay the packets to the web server. So this is the over, overlay routing. Multi-homing tends to be more effective at bypassing failure near the edge, while overlay routing can probably offer more benefits are about bypassing failures in the core of the network. So now let's first look at the loop anomalies. So in this graph, we want to study how significant a loop is. So the more routers or ASs are involved in a routing loop, the more significant, the more negative effect the loop on the network. So in this graph, the x-axis is the number of routers in a routing loop, the y-axis shows the ratio of the loops. So one interesting thing we notice here is a temporary loop tends to involve more routers than persistent loops. So 97% of the persistent loops only involve two routers, while this ratio is 51% for temporary loops. Uh, remind me, what is the definition of temporary loops? Uh, temporary is if we, the loops stay here for a very long time until the when the trace are terminates, the loop is still there. We classify them as uh, persistent. If the loop got resolved before the trace out terminates, then we call it uh, so, so 30 minutes is the boundary. Is that right? uh, I think it depends on how it long. The duration of one trace, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's probably two or three seconds. So the, intuitively, the more routers that are involved in a loop, the less stable the loop is. So that's why we see temporary loops involve more routers than persistent loops. Also, we look at the number of ASs that are involved in loops. We find only 1% of the persistent loop across multiple ASs, while this ratio is 15% for temporary loops. We know the internet has some mechanism to suppress inter-AS loops. So at least from this study, we found that the AS loop suppression mechanism works pretty well. So inter AS loop can only stay for a very short period. So now let's look at how we select service providers as our normal users. We quantify the distribution of these routing loops. We map the loop into, into different tiers based on their location. So this graph, the, the blue and the red bar shows the ratio of loops in that tier, and the yellow bar shows the relative share of traffic in that tier. As we can see, the tier 3 ASs incur more routing loops than the relative share of traffic in that tier. So the tier 3 ASs are the least, least stable ASs. Compared with tier 1, they only incur a very small number of routing loops compared with the traffic in, in that tier. So the tier 1 ASs are more stable. So intuitively, because the tier 1 ASs 
are the largest ASs on the internet, so they are more well maintained than smaller ASs. So another surprising thing is we notice there are less routing loops in tier five ASs. So although the tier five ASs are very small networks, so this is because for routing loops to, to exist, there must exist some alternate paths. So because in tier five ASs, they are very small, so there are less path diversity there. So the loops are less likely to, to appear in those ASs. So we also look at the distribution of routing loops within the tier one ASs because they represent the largest ISPs on the internet. We find that the worst 10% uh, tier one ASs in terms of the number of uh, persistent loops they contain, they contribute to 20% of the total traffic. However, they have more than 35% of the total persistent loops. This means the distribution of persistent loop even within the tier one ASs are highly skilled. So as a customer, if I want to have more stable service, it might make sense for me to connect directly to tier one or tier two ASs. Or if I want to connect to the tier one ASs, I might want to avoid those tier one ASs, which are less stable than other ASs. I have a question. So you said, you said a few things like there's less passive What do you mean by large or smaller routers? Just asking if maybe it's a function of configuration complexity that's independent of traffic volume. Mm, I'm not sure how to compare the size of the routers. So I think uh, normally people compare the size of the router depending on the, the traffic volume they can support. Okay. Or depends on the links they have or depends on the functionality of their routers. I think for the core routers on the, in the larger ASs, they can often like both run IGP and uh, BGP. So they tend to provide more functionality than the small routers. So, um, so what's your question? Please. Okay, did you quantify that there's less path diversity in tier four and five? Uh, so, we don't have the topology of all the ASs on the internet. I think uh, intuitively there should be less path diversity in the small networks. Otherwise, because these small networks, they usually just stay within a very uh, narrow geographic locations. So, it doesn't make sense for them to have uh, too much path diversity. Also, they just run simple routing protocols. Okay. So, how do you tier four? Because you can have a large percentage of the persistent routing versus the amount of traffic. So, the persistent loops in tier four, I think it's, so the persistent loop can stay either due to like uh, many reasons, probably due to like link audit or misconfigurations. So I think it's, uh, so I don't have the enough data to verify what's the root cause of this personal. I suspect one of the possible reasons, if a tier four lo lose a connection to one of its client, and uh, the client can uh, configure its uh, routing with uh, default routing, so that will cause the persistent loop between the client and the tier four ASs. So, but uh, I, I don't know how to verify the, the loops, what's the root cause of these loops. So. Um, not to add to 100%. So for the loops, if it uh, spans multiple ASs, it might maps to multiple tiers. So the loop doesn't add up to 100%. But for the traffic. But my basic question is, I mean, like, what is the limit 
random number of tier 1, tier 2, tier 3, so what's the one that we call the zero effect because the attention of the tier 3 is very high, right? Yep, yep. And let's say most of the ISPs you saw, most of the ISPs you saw were tier 3. Okay, okay. The, the traffic, uh, we also use the traffic to compare with the loops. So the traffic means how many times we traverse our tier 3 ASs. So that means the chance we can observe a, observe a routing loops. So how to interpret this graph is, for the tier 3 ASs, if we, during like 23% of time, we go through a tier 3 ASs, but the total number of loops in that tier is 44%. Then that means that the tier 3 ASs involve more. So the tier, the So we will only count one of them because for each loop, we will only count one for each tier. Like even it might traverse two ASs in each tier, we will count this only one for the AS inlet. For example, if a loop incur three tier three, one tier one, then we still count one for the tier one and one for the tier three. So this graph shows the duration of the persistent loops. So uh, as we can see, most of the persistent loops, they very short, like more than 50% of them got resolved within uh, half an hour. But there do exist some persistent loops stay for a long period of time, like close to 20% of them stay more than seven and a half hours. So this is a little bit surprising because the internet is designed to be self-heating. But we, we see that there do exist some long live loops which might require human intervention to repel. So these loops might occur due to misconfigurations or uh, severe failures that requires replacement of hardware like repair a link or router which take a long time to recover. So now let's look at how well we can pinpoint path changes and path audits. So in this graph, the x-axis shows the number of routers in, uh, in the scope of a failure. The y-axis shows the C, uh, fraction of the, in the CDF graph. So as we can see, so pass outages occur closer, or we can narrow the pass outage better than the pass changes. So for 60% of the pass outage, we can narrow them down to just one hop. And for 75% of pass outage, we can narrow them down to four hops why we can only do this for 68% of the past changes. Also, look at the number of ASs. We can narrow 78% of past audit to within just two ASs, while we can only do this for 57% of the past changes. So now let's look at how close the anomalies, the past change audits to the edge of the network. So because we know multi-homing is better at um, bypassing failures near the edge. So in this graph, the x-axis shows the number of hops of failure to the edge of the network. And the y-axis is a fraction of the CDF. So we notice that 44% of the pass outage actually occur at the last hop. Also, pass outage occur closer to the edge of the network than pass changes. 72% of the pass outage occur just within four hops to the end holes, while this ratio is 40% for pass changes. So intuitively, because there's, again, there's less diversity of paths at near the edge of the network, so a failure at the edge are more likely to exhibit as a pass outage, while a failure in the core of the network will, will exhibit as pass changes. Because there are so many uh, outages occur closer to the edge of the network. This means multi-homing could be very useful in bypassing this failure. 
So uh, in this graph, as we have shown before, we also look at the distribution of pass orders and pass changes across five tiers. Consistent with the previous result, the, uh, the pass orders and the changes in tier three is far more than these changes in other tiers. So which means the tier three ASs seem to be more problematic while the tier one ASs are more stable. So now let's look at how effective overlay routing can help bypass failures on the internet. So we, we call overlay routing can successfully bypass a failure if it can reestablish connectivity during the problematic period. In our study, we found overlay routing can successfully bypass 43% of the failures. So this ratio is a little bit lower than the previous study. So probably because we, we observe a more diverse network passes, also, we see more pass failures occur closer to the edge of the network. So overlay routing is not going to be very helpful for those failures without multi-homing. What's an example of one of the previous studies that you think of? Uh, it, uh, I think one of the study it's a uh, um, 2003 Symmetrics paper from Nick Finster and David Anderson. They tried to study the effectiveness of overlay routing by running the resilient overlay network has bad among 30, I think 33, 36 also nodes on the internet. However, the path they can observe is only between those 36 nodes. However, in our case, we observe more diverse network passes. So, so it seems that you're, you're just looking at a different set, and that would explain, it's not that there was a flaw in the methodology in previous studies, just look at a different I, I assume our, the result in our study is more representative because the network paths in their case are very limited. Also, many of the nodes they have are in the .edu site, and those nodes are well maintained with good network connection, while in our case, the clients come from all over the world, so the connection in there is probably worse. So that's why we observe more last hop failures. So although overlay routing can help bypass failures on the internet, we find in many cases it can incur latency inflation. So in this graph, uh, the x-axis is the ratio of the overlay, the, the alternate paths to the latency of the default internet paths. So as we can see, 32% uh, of the alternate paths inflate the latency by more than a factor of two. In the worst 10% cases, the overlay path can inflate the latency by more than a factor of 10. So in this case, although overlay routing can help reestablish connectivity, but because the latency of the path is so large, these paths are still not going to be very useful. So here is a summary of the planisphere work. So in planisphere, we introduced new techniques for detecting routing problems by passively observing TCP traffic. Our technique requires no collaborations from both ends of the path, so we can observe not just the paths between, between those participating nodes. So in Planisphere, we confirm and classify these anomalies based on the trace patterns, and we try to coordinate probing from multiple vantage points to isolate these failures. Because Planisphere is the end system based approach, it can be used to diagnose failure in anywhere on the internet, not just within certain ISPs. Because most of our probing are done during the problematic period, we, can, we incur very limited probing overhead and can easily scale to a large number of nodes. So in Planisphere, we confirmed more than 200,000 routing problems in just three months. So this detection rate is 100 times higher than previous approach based on end-to-end uh, probing. In Planisphere, we will observe a uh, different behavior for persistent and temporary loops. Persistent loops, they involve fewer routers, and they can they either resolve very quickly or they can stay for a long time. Pass audits and pass changes also show different behavior. Pass audits occur closer to the edge of the network, and we can narrow pass audits better than pass changes. The failure distribution is highly skewed. The tier 1 ASs are most stable, while the tier 3 ASs are most problematic. Within the tier 1 ASs, a small number of AS contribute to 
to a disproportionately large number of persistent loops. Overly routing can help bypass 43% of the failures in our study, and we find they can often incur latency inflation. So now let me give a brief overview of the multi-pass TCP work. So multi-pass TCP is a new transport layer protocol for improving and okay, improving end-to-end -end robustness and uh, throughputs using the redundant passes. So as we have seen before, the failures on the internet uh, occur frequently. The TCP is the dominant transport layer protocol on today's internet. However, TCP is not well designed for failure recovery. It has very poor performance under severe congestion and is vulnerable to pass disruption. However, previous study has found that there exists many redundant passes between a pair of hosts on the internet. So overlay routing and multi-homing can use this alternate path to bypass failure. And uh, sometimes a mobile user might have access to multiple wireless links like either a 3G links or 802.11 links. So this motivates us to develop a transport layer protocol called MTCP. In MTCP, we can aggregate the bandwidth on multiple passes in parallel. Also, we can improve the robustness, end-to-end -end robustness, uh, under failures by using those redundant passes simultaneously. So why would you want to do a multiple 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 TCP? Why not do multiple TCP connections over different bus and use application level frame? That's what all the content that you need to in the world are in the network. That's what they're doing, right? Right. So why, why aggregate this into the TCP? Why not just use multiple TCP connections and go with multiple nodes? So I think one of the reasons that we might have is, uh, suppose we have a VPN, a large corporation might have VPN nodes across different locations. So the VPN, each VPN flow is actually as a single large flow. So they will traverse the same path because to a network service provider, all these, no, all these small flows are aggregate as a single flow. So I think that's uh, mm, so that Sorry? Why not just OK. Actually, oh, so can I? Can you repeat your question, Alex? No, I was just wondering, instead of designing the TCP that can offer to multiple bus, uh, you're probably going to talk about your ordering and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, why not just use multiple TCP over different bus and aggregate the data later at the application level? I think that's OK. Yeah, okay. Bits are in byte range query, whatever. So I think the, the, the advantage of using um, the multi-pass TCP flow is it not just aggregate bandwidth, but it can also provide a robustness on the pass failures. If you just use a single pass flow, it fails, it just stay there. Right? By using multiple passes, whenever one of the pass failure, we can quickly migrate the failures, uh, migrate the data to another pass. Also, another advantage is uh, by, you, by taking care of the uh, the multipass at the application layer, that will require us to modify the application. While using multipass TCP, we don't need to touch the application. The application... Yeah, but, but I would argue that we can take it up and I mean, the different applications need different things, right? So if I'm browsing the web, I probably don't need multipass TCP. I mean, I'm doing very popular transfer. Yeah, but still, I think the by doing this at the application layer, you have to develop some splitting package striping technique for every application. So if we can do this at uh, providing a common suite, a common protocol, then all the applications take, can take advantage of this. So I think we can talk about this about offline. So, so there are a number of challenges we have to address in developing a protocol like MTCP using redundant passes. The first thing is, Different passes, paths might have different conditions like latency or loss rate. So we have to do per pass congestion control 
on to efficiently aggregate bandwidth on all the paths. The second is pass my shield congestion. So this is another reason that you you just ask. So if we just run, um, if we just using separate TCP flows, they might share congestion. So they might be more aggressive to other single pass TCP flows. So we actually uh, integrate uh, shell congestion detection mechanism into MTCP, so we can dynamically detect shell congestion in the multipass flow and uh, try to suppress those flows which are shell congestion and ensure MTCP is not too aggressive than other single pass flows. So what you're saying is the MTCP uses some the the total bandwidth sensing would be as if it's sensing you some average of one of those five pass, or would it end up sensing maybe five times as much bandwidth? So it, it depends on how the paths are. If these paths are totally independent, they don't share congestion, then MTCP will aggregate all the bandwidth. But if some of the paths share congestion, then in MTCP will provide a mechanism to suppress those one of the flows who share congestion. So to ensure, just to ensure MTCP is not too aggressive to other single pass flow. So that's one another reason why we should do this at the MTCP level instead of the application level. The third is the path may fail. So in MTCP, we provide a mechanism to recover from path failures within a few seconds. This is much faster than relying on the routing layer to recover from failures or relying on overlay routing, which is still use active probing, will still take uh, tens of seconds to recover from failure. Finally, there might exist many alternate paths between a pair of hosts. In MTCP, we try to select a subset of the paths to use so we can avoid concurrent failures and try to uh, prevent shell congestion. So I'm planning to uh, continue my work uh, in a few directions. The first is uh, internet troubleshooting. So as we have seen before, the existing end system based approach for failure diagnosis has many limitations. Although Planisir can increase the accuracy of failure diagnosis, but in many cases, Planisir still cannot pinpoint the exact location of the failure. So I want to understand if this is due to the fundamental limitation of an end system based approach, or it's just due to lack of vantage point or suboptimal uh, decision in choosing the probing point. So because the end system based approach is very appealing, it's used for, for diagnosing failures on any parts of the internet. So we want to investigate furthermore. The second is, the, we, I want to develop new techniques for failure recoveries. Existing techniques like overlay routing or multi-homing rely on active probing to monitor the health of paths and select the appropriate paths. However, this approach incur probing overhead and may not be very scalable as the system become larger. So, in M so I want to understand if we can take advantage of the failure diagnosis information so we can develop a new failure recovery uh, mechanism to recover from failures even more quickly, like achieve zero failure time, or we can reduce the probing overhead. Finally, I want to, so the current existing internet infrastructure is mostly designed for rich functionality of high performance by ignoring diagnosability or debugability. So I want to investigate how we can make minimum change to the existing internet infrastructure to facilitate failure diagnosis. So what kind of mechanism do we need between the ISPs to cooperate to diagnose failures? And what kind of additional information the routers should export to help failure diagnosis. So performance degradation on the internet is not just caused by router, the hardware, or software failures. So many performance degradation can be caused by worm propagation or D denial service attack. So I want to investigate techniques for identifying not just the origin of a failure to a router or AS. I also want to identify the malicious attacker who introduced these problems. Finally, I'm also interested in the failure diagnosis or troubleshooting in wireless networks. So this is the end of my talk, and I'm free to take any question. I have a question about the 
So I don't have a clear, I, because we don't have any real data on this, so I can't see which fraction are caused. But at least in our study, we find many problems are actually due to routing problems. So, so this, by solving this routing problem will help us significantly improve the robustness of end-to-end -end communication. So. Sorry? Per minute? Oh, at one every two minutes. Okay, anyway. So, how many clients? Clients, we have, um, in our monitoring period, we observed 900,000 unique clients. Yeah, so if the failure distribution is uniform, then that's the number you get. But however, we find that it totally, some of the network passes are more unstable than others. It's uh, some clients actually consistently run into problems like uh, every several days or also. Although I don't have a, a specific number here, but uh, when I manually look at the the failures, I do observe many clients appear multiple times. So my guess is the network, the distribution of failure along the network passes is, is also skewed. I think the uh, I I don't have directly contact with uh, people in the coding project, which develop a CDN service. But from some random talk, I heard that many of the clients use them to download big files, like images or music. So, I think one of the reason they told me that they want to go through censorship. So some websites restrict uh, access to them. Do to access it, or is it um, certain uh, certain content providers subscribe to the Oh, it's a client. Each client, self yeah, is self-selecting. Yeah. We, we, ha we can't distinguish between these two cases. Because um, remember when we confirm uh, pass audit, we use two conditions. Either the one of the condition is uh, partial unreachability, which means although the local CDN node cannot reach the client, there exists a remote node who can reach the client at that moment. So we know the client is not down. However, it's due to some routing problem between the CDN node to the client. So if it was Yeah, in um, that case, we probably don't know. You don't mark it as confirmed. Right, right. Okay. That's one of the reasons that we have so many suspicious events because it's really difficult for us to to make sure that anomaly is actually due to some some routing problems. But for those confirmed anomalies, we do have we are pretty much confident about they are due to routing problems. Okay. Great. Thank you very much.